Hi everyone, welcome to our latest Book Trip live chat, a Merrill Moss media production. Today we are speaking with business leader Susan Packard about her new book, New Rules of the Game, 10 Strategies for Women in the Workplace. Thank you so much for joining us today, Susan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm delighted to be and here. And Susan is the co-founder of the Scripps Network team, and she's former COO of the HGTV Cable Network. And under her helm, HGTV became one of the fastest growing cable networks in television history. She also helped build powerhouse media brands HBO and CNBC. So without further ado, Susan, uh, before we start our questions, can you tell us a little bit more about new rules of the game? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'll also tell you why I wrote it, which a friend of mine who had written a few business books, a woman, you know, she said um, to me three years ago, you know, Susan, you might want to write about your career story because it's kind of an interesting one. And I sat back and I thought, well, what were all the contributing factors that helped me to get top right. posts at media companies? And that ended up um, being captured in this book um, under an umbrella called gamesmanship. And, you know, gamesmanship, it just very uh, succinctly, it are behaviors and strategies that help you to comfortably compete in the workplace so that you can advance. Absolutely, that's one of the key things that you bring up. And you also talk about gamers, too. And when I first started, I thought, oh, gamers, I'm thinking of, like, my friends in high school in the basement playing video games. But what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I know, and it does have both meanings. But for me, what I meant by it um, is those are the folks that you work with who are willing to um, compete in right. the workplace. And um, they're a lot of fun to work with because they mm -hmm. spur you on Absolutely. to be better. And Audrey has a question um, about something from the foreword of the book. Um, she says, can you tell us about the women's gatherings that you put together and you scheduled? And what were those like? And you know, what kind of breakthroughs yeah. did you have during those? Right. Um, yeah, I, I scheduled, I created this brown bag lunch um, event at HGTV. And this is where um, we would get together. I mean, men were not excluded, but it was a work-life balance right. theme. And so it was 90% mm -hmm. women. And um, I would just bring speakers in from whether it was the community or somebody um, from outside the community to address various work-life balance mm -hmm. challenges that we were facing as women. And um, they were, and then we ended up, you know, so somebody talked for a while, and then after that we, we ended up um, conversing together about the issues. And it was, we ended up mentoring one another. It, it was very fulfilling. That's amazing. And I, I feel that the work-life balance thing is so important. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of how you can change a company that might not have that? What's like an easy way to kind of implement that? Right. Um, the well, you know, if if there was an easy way and really an answer <laughs> yeah. to this, the, the big book would have already been written and it would have been, you know, a mm -hmm. bestseller. Um, and but for my company, um, what I did was as we were starting out HGTV, is with the help of a great HR resource person, uh, Julie Cookson. We called around to other media companies to find out with established media companies what kind of work-life balance, balance benefits were they providing. And then we sort of took, you know, all of the best ideas and then we presented them to the executive group and implemented work-life balance strategies um, at HGTV, which, you know, of course, they're only so good as whether your leadership um, follows mm -hmm. them too. So um, I did my best um, to, you know, also adhere to all of those. That's great. Um, Becca has a question about the 10 rules of gamesmanship. And so without, I guess, you know, revealing too much in the book, can you briefly tell us the 10 rules or just a little, just touch upon them a little bit? Sure. Um, well, the first rule, and these are under, you know, theme, just think right. about it this way. Um, what I'm suggesting is that, you act like an athlete would, okay? Gamesmanship is about expressing your competitive spirit comfortably, having composure, having mental fortitude, and thinking like and behaving right. like a winner. 
And so under that, as sort of the umbrella, um, are these 10 strategies. The first one is conditioning. So just like an athlete needs to condition their body for game day, so too do we need conditioning skills if we want to make it into the senior um, uh -huh. management circle. And so I suggest I suggest three of those. Um, that's the, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I suggest three strategies for conditioning. Um, the second is composure, which is how we carry ourselves and how we communicate. And so I talk about various ways we can um, gain composure, regain composure, things that like sleep is very important to us. You know, if we don't have enough sleep, it's easier to act emotionally and act that out at true. work. So that's just one thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, because we're because we're women, we um, we're there is that bias in the workplace that we're going to be really emotional about everything. And so composure is important for women. You know, if you want to. Yeah, I did position. love that part. Um, third is, not to interrupt you, but I love that you made a reference to Mariano Rivera and how he was, you know, so cool and calm during all his games. And it's amazing how you can literally make a connection with sports in every single part of this book. It's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, some women have said, oh, I'm not, I don't like, to, I don't like sports. Uh, it's really more exactly. a symbol. It's really, I know I'm using it as sort, as sort of mm -hmm. metaphor. And, and, you know, who knows, maybe you'll learn a little something about sports that can help you converse in the workplace yeah, as well. But um, it's not it's not it's not too much detail on sports. It's just more about that that thinking like an athlete and behaving like an athlete. Um, so three is um, offense, okay. playing offense. So much like an athlete scores points exactly. for their game, um, so too if you're playing offense in your company, you are making money for your company. And um, you know I talk about various ways to do that, but I also caution. For women, you know, we have to ask if we're going to get the resources we need yeah. to be successful. But how we ask as women is tricky because, you know, we can get those B words right. that we're called, you know, of which bossy's the <laughs> nicest one. So, um, so I talk about artfully being artfully assertive, and that's right. that chapter. Um, do you want me to go through all ten, Amanda? Because I just yeah, just going? you can briefly go over them, and then we'll we'll go through some other questions okay. that kind of gloss over them again. Okay, great. Okay, great. So four is brinksmanship, and this is the game of negotiations. Right. Um, you know, it, it'd be great to assume that everything you ask for in the workplace you'll get, but more likely than that, you'll enter into a negotiation. Yeah. So that's about how we how you know various strategies for the best ways to negotiate. Um, the, the fifth chapter is fan clubs, and you know, if I'm asked, well, what's the most important chapter? Sometimes the audience is surprised to hear that I say the um, fan clubs, building mm -hmm. fan clubs, building right. your network, because it's not just about you and your supervisor at work. Sometimes mm -hmm. we think that, but there are lots of people around us who can help us to advance, but we have to mm -hmm. seek the help. So. I talk about various ways you can do that in that in that chapter. Six is practice, practice, practice. That's just saying that our careers are marathons, Absolutely. not sprints. And so try to not lose patience. Um, if you don't get that first promotion, um, I sure didn't get the first promotion. I mean, just stay right. with it. Um, if you if you like to go to work every day, you're not going to love yeah. everything you do. But if you wake up and say, I like to go to work today. Yeah. I like this place. Then exactly. stick with it, um, and, you know, and follow some of follow some of the other strategies. Um, so that's that. Seven is um, uniforms, and that's just about dress code. Um, it's funny. Every interview I've had on this book, and you know, CNN, they ask about this <laughs> chapter. So tell me about dress. Tell me about how you should dress at work. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is still so yeah. When relevant. I was reading it, I was thinking um, I shouldn't so, ask her too many of these. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Isn't yeah. that funny though? I know, and you know, obviously, I um, I make I have yeah, fun with really the chapter. I, Amanda, mm -hmm. you know that, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the last three, um, eight, nine, ten, are part two of the book, and it moves us from being a worker to being yeah. a leader, and it's under the umbrella of gaining emotional maturity. 
And so I talk about three, in, th in three chapters, I cover various scenarios for how we can gain emotional maturity so we can move ourselves into leadership. Excellent. Service. That's yeah. the fastest I've ever given that whole book. I love it. <laughs> I think I did that about three minutes. Now, going back to composure, um, and I thought this was interesting, and we have a question from Marley. She wants to know, what is verbal composure, and how can we keep it in check? Because I don't think everyone realizes that you need to keep your verbal composure. Right. Um, I cited a statistic, um, McKinsey in the book, McKinsey did some research, and it turns out that women say an average of 20,000 words a day, and men say an average of 7,000 words mm -hmm. a day. So when you're working with men, and you sometimes wonder why there's a communication gap, um, and I've worked with men my whole career, uh, I, I regretfully I haven't had a lot of side-by-side um, -side work with women. And so what I learned very quickly is that I had to be succinct. Right. So verbal composure is about being succinct and clear. And you know what? You can role play these things um, mm -hmm. mentally. So if you're going into a meeting and there's a point you want to make, and you know that the, you know, the topic of the meeting is X, you can role play that in your head. Okay, here's how I want to say it. And you can say it with clarity and brevity. But that's what verbal composure is all about. And... I also loved your anecdote about your aunt Elsie. It made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah. being artfully assertive or then being painfully polite? I love those terms. Right, right. Well, um, Amanda's referring to um, I'm half Greek and half Italian, and my Greek, I had nine um, aunts and uncles on the Greek side, and mostly women. And they are really spitfire <laughs> women. And one of my aunts, Aunt Elsie, she um, she would she was almost like she would test me when um, I'd come home mm -hmm. to Detroit, and she'd want to know what were, the, what were the latest things that were going on, and then she'd tell me stories about her experiences being a very high brow yeah. waitress, and how you know she would make sure she would get the best tips, and because she did this or that, and so um, anyway, but she used a lot of profanity, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> including. Including, you know, F words and things like that. So um, what I was trying to suggest in this chapter is to not, you don't have to use profanity, and you don't have to um, ask in such a direct, um, assertive, aggressive way that you're turning right. off your audience, um, whoever that person may be that you're trying to, that you're seeking resources from. So there are ways that you can ask that, I, you know, I say it's you have backbone, but you're not breaking the other person's back in asking. And I give examples in that chapter of, of um, yeah. how to do that. Now, this is an important question that just popped up from Allie. And she says, what's the best way to ask for a raise? <laughs> yeah. And this is, and ladies, you know, we're still 72 cents mm -hmm. on the dollar. So we make 72 cents to men's $1. And that's been consistent. Um, I think it's moved up a tad right. in the last many years, but not much. And you know, we're we're at fault here because I'm not saying we're fully at fault, but one of the things that we could do a better job of is asking. So I love that you that you're asking that question, Allie. Um, here's what I would do. Um, one of the one of the things that happened to me as I, as I was working is I saw that my job responsibilities were increasing, but nobody was talking to me about any more money or any new title or anything. And I was taking on a lot more. So um, I actually called a friend who had, she was a headhunter, so she had a general sense of what um, was out there in the marketplace as far as range of compensation. Right. And um, I found out what you know, that range was, which included men, and I put together data, and I went in, and I said, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, not, ma I'm not making what you're having me do. I'm not making enough to compensate for what you're having me do mm -hmm. these days. And, it, you know, if you can't get somebody objective like a headhunter, um, this is why you need yeah. a network. Because you can talk to others who may be in a comparable position to your own who either are at your company or aren't at your company and ask them, 
you know, can you even tell me, you know, maybe this is uncomfortable, but can you even give me a range of, you know, what you think this job should pay? And, um, and, and so that way, at least you're not walking in and going, I deserve a $5,000 raise. You know, I mean, you can't, that, that will go on deaf ears. But if you say that you've done research, you know what's going on in the market, and um, you've talked to colleagues who, you know, have similar jobs, and, you know, that's yeah. how you do it. And, then, and, and you know what? The worst they're going to say is not, not yeah, right now. Exactly. You know, they may say. Yeah, I mean, maybe in six months. And then you know what you can say back to them? Can you evaluate me again absolutely. in six months instead of waiting mm -hmm. another year? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't hurt to ask. Um, Susan has an excellent question, um, and it focuses on my favorite part, I think, of the book about brinksmanship, which I found really fascinating. Um, Susan says, there's a great section on brinksmanship and examples of this in movies and on TV. Um, and she says, can you elaborate on this? Right, right. Um, well, brinksmanship is the, the game of negotiations. Right. And <laughs> what I use um, a lot of sport, team sports in the book just, again, as right. metaphor. But that's not the mm -hmm. only thing I use. See, I grew up playing, I loved playing games mm -hmm. growing up. Card games, board games, video games, all those games I loved growing up. And so this particular chapter, Truthfully, I learned most of my negotiating skill through playing poker, which I love, you know, in, in yeah. card games. And, uh, and so um, I recommend four different moves, if you will, um, in, in negotiating. One is sometimes we have to yeah. bluff because we're, you know, we're, we're trying to kind of feel out the person across the table. And um, so I talk about that. I talk about sizing yep. up the room, um, knowing where the decision makers, who the decision makers are around the table or whenever you're negotiating. Yep. You need to know that because sometimes, for example, a lawyer will be talking, 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 but lawyers are typically not the decision makers. The business people are. So that kind of thing. And then, um, and I, I guess there, you know, so there, there are three or four of those kinds of different ways of um, being able to win at negotiating. Right. And some of it is just a lot of yeah. theater. And, you know, when you're working, my experience of working with men and negotiating across the table is that they like a lot of theater. Um, you know, it's win, lose, no hard feelings yeah. at the end. Whereas for us, as, as women, we're often in a situation where we want to win-win, but because maybe we're negotiating with men or it just isn't going to work out that way, there's a lose. And when there's a lose, there can right. be hard feelings. So the book is that this particular chapter is about how we can overcome mm -hmm. all of that. Excellent. And um, we talked briefly about um, your book, uh, your chapter on suiting up. And so <laughs> I have one question about it. What are some power pieces that you wear for good luck that you mentioned? That's my favorite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, it's, um, it's yes. mostly jewelry that I wear for good luck. So I have some Mikimoto Beautiful. pearls. Um, yeah, and they make me feel mm -hmm. very powerful. I have, um, I have a pair of diamond earrings, stud earrings that I bought myself when I concluded a very difficult two-year negotiation oh, wow. so um, it was really kind of it was kind of funny because I was in New York and um, you know I bought these things and uh, later in the day my husband called me and he said were you buying something today <laughs> uh, yeah and he said yeah because I got a call from Visa <laughs> confirming that you, you spent XYZ oh, and I said oh my god I can't, I can't get away with anything oh, around funny. here. So anyway, he, he was, yeah, I was a good natured. Um, but anyway, so um, for me, jewelry is, is, I have a lot of yeah. good luck pieces with jewelry. Something my mother, my mother's passed away, but I have a bracelet still and things like that that just empower, make yeah. me feel like empowered. the finishing touches the icing on the cake. <laughs> Literally the diamond icing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, um, Marley um, mentioned the Ban Bossy campaign that's recognized and backed by a lot of celebrities, and you talk about that a little bit. Can you tell us more about that and why Bossy can be a good thing? Right. Um, in my chapter on playing offense, you know, there's regardless of how artfully assertive mm -hmm. we are, um, some we still have to ask. Right. And sometimes just the very um, action of asking those that are on the receiving end can label us as right. bossy. And you know what? You have to you you have to think to yourself that this is not your issue. This is their issue. Um, if you're asking respectfully and you're asking for what is for the good of right. the company, not, you know, something personal, then um, you're doing the right thing. And if somebody wants to label you as bossy, that's fine. Um, I tell a story in there, one of the women that I interviewed, because by the way, this book is not just my story. There are right. a dozen CEOs that mm -hmm. I interviewed that are mostly women, but some mm -hmm. men too. And one of um, the women was um, Amy Miles, who runs Regal Entertainment. She told me a story about her niece right. and her nephew and how she would listen to her family. You know, if the nephew wanted to play, you know, um, Batman right. um, and made the knee and she and she would make the he would make the niece be Robin. Now then, then the little niece would say, "Well, wait a minute now. Okay, now I'm we're going to play teacher, and I'm the teacher, and you're the student." And he'd say, "I don't want to be the student. I want to be the teacher." And and the and the parents were like, "Don't be so bossy. Oh, wow. Don't be so bossy." And, I remember and that, Amy, yeah. Amy pulled her aside, and she <laughs> yeah. And Amy pulled her aside, and she said, "You know what? It's okay to be a little bossy." <laughs> so wow, that's amazing. The difference now, yeah. Kate. I mean, even yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Kate mentions that you speak at universities about global business, and are you are you still doing that? Right. Um, she I says, am. do you ever get nervous while public speaking, yeah, I, and any tips for overcoming that? I always huh? get nervous when I'm publicly speaking, <laughs> and you know, I've read enough about it now that it's actually a good thing to have a little bit of nervousness. Because it's um, it's exactly. energy, so that when you're up there, because it's really a performance. Yeah. Um, if you think about it that way, you know, like watching a play yeah. or a movie or whatever the case may be, you know, you're you're trying to inform, inspire, entertain all of those things, and that takes a lot of energy. I can't tell you how drained I am after I do a 45 minute presentation, but that's good because that means that I was. You know, I gave it all yeah, that I could. Absolutely. And, um, and you know, you can just practice. If there's nothing else you remember from, you know, this half an hour today with us talking is practicing will get you over fears and, you know, nervousness. Just try it once. And if you kind of fall flat on your face, um, pick yourself up and try yeah. it again. And you're going to eventually get. I'm a. I'm so much more comfortable speaking today than I was, you know, five years ago. Uh, but that's just because I kept mm -hmm. trying. Absolutely, I am in the same boat. <laughs> um, your your chapter practice, practice, practice. Um, speaking of practice, that was. It's a huge part in sports and also in the workplace. Um, and I found it interesting. You mentioned, you know, athletes will watch tapes of themselves to kind of just hone their skills and see what they're doing wrong, what they're doing right, and to just, you know, be sharp uh, mentally. So how can one stay mentally active in a work setting? What are some things that people can do? Um, well, staying mentally, there's, you know, mentally active and there's yeah. actually physically active. Hand hand, right? And physically active ones, yeah, they really do. And um, especially when you're having sort of that mid-afternoon lull. <laughs> so getting up and, and walking around and getting a drink and connecting with someone and sitting in their cube or in their office and just talking right. a few minutes. Um, get out of the four walls of your exactly. department. And again, maybe in the very beginning you might be a little nervous mm -hmm. about this, but if you can do this, you can meet new people and you can learn 
what they're doing just so that it's informative for you, so you have a bigger picture of the company. And um, so one of the ways to be physically active is to literally walk around. And I know we're all busy, but you also find your, I know I used to find myself about between two and four just sort of going, oh, I got to get up and I got to walk around. Definitely. Because, um, you know, there's only so much, yeah. So that's physically active. And then mentally active is, um, you know, learning, reading. Um, go, maybe you're going to take um, a, a class. You know, I didn't have any finance background. So I had to go and take a class on finance so that I could be a chief operating officer. So I went, you know, to a university and I learned the fundamentals, not the real detail, but just the fundamentals that I needed to know. And um, so mentally active is really all about reading and learning, reading about your industry, yeah. learning about more about your industry, and talking to people that might be in your industry so that you can have some yeah, constant self-teaching. Very important. Yeah. Exactly. Chase uh, wants to know what are the benefits of using humor in the workplace? Right. Um, and this is in my fan clubs chapter. This is a way to um, endear yourself right. to people. And, you know, this is one of those where I was paranoid to try to use humor. You know, I noticed how the guys would stand up and when they were addressing the room, they would always have some icebreaker that was funny, you know, or maybe it wasn't so funny, but, you know, you laughed yeah. politely. And I thought to myself, you know, there must be something to that. So then I tried it. And, you know, in the beginning, I was very embarrassed and I fell flat on my face. And I still do. But um, humor is something that makes you accessible to others, especially if you are, you know, in, in charge of a team, whether it's two people or 20 people. Um, Sometimes, you know, you, you mess up and, you know, having self-effacing yeah. humor about it is making yourself human and accessible to the rest of your team instead of always having to, you know, feel like you have to sit up yeah. on this perch, right? I mean, we all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I talk about the various ways to try to get comfortable using humor. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you do stand-up comedy, you know, like this rock. <laughs> I, I'm really just talking about being comfortable, um, smiling right. and laughing, you know, enjoying yeah. yourself at work. Not always having a, a puss on. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, now, right. you talk about good sportsmanship and how it can, you know, be overlooked sometimes. What are some tactics for good sportsmanship? Well, um, you get once you're in the situation where you're in a competition. Um, there's going to be, you know, again, I'd love to say there's a winner winner, right. but you know, more often than not, there's winner mm -hmm. loser. So if you are the loser, for example, the best thing to do, and it, it can be, you know, you have to sort of really dig deep for this, but the best thing you do is you call up the person or you walk into their office who won and you say, you know what, congratulations, you won yeah. that one. And you acknowledge that um, somebody, you know, won that particular round, whatever it was, you know, if it's a resource or a deal or whatever the case may be, um, that's, called, that's good sportsmanship. And I know I did, you know, I lost a promotion to um, a gentleman who um, I was working with we were both vying for this job and he got it and he was in a different office. So I called him and I congratulated him. And today, you know, 15 years later, we're still friends. Yeah. So finding, finding the resources within you to shake off loss yeah. and to, and to hold yourself you know, respectfully and hold your head high, chin up, you know, all of those things are part of good sportsmanship. Excellent answer. Um, Lexi wants to know, what books are you reading right now? Do you have any that you could recommend to us? Anything off the top of your head? Um, you know, I love the Brene Brown books, yeah. um, Gifts of Imperfection. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great book. I loved in it, she talks about, you know, stop hustling for worthiness. I just think that's a powerful yeah. phrase. Um, so I love, you know, so I love her stuff, and um, I'm reading um, David Brooks' book on character, which is, um, I think, a fascinating read. 
Um, you know, what does it really mean to have character and to build yeah. character? So those are a couple. And then I read a lot of, as my husband calls them, oil cover books. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so those I won't yeah. recommend. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, do you have an, the overarching idea kind of in the intro, um, Alex brings this up. Uh, why are some women comfortable with competition while others are not? Very interesting thing. Right. Um, first of all, I think you may be, some of it is what you're right. born with. It's what your DNA. Um, I was born to be, I was just very competitive as I was growing up. And uh, you know, God's sorry joke on me. I didn't have one athletic bone in my body, right? So what to do? <laughs> so I would channel it in the, in the games that I played, board games, card games, whatever. Um, so some, some of it is genetic. Um, right. I think some of it is um, an achievement orientation mm -hmm. that is good for us to have. So we want to achieve and we want to do well. And to do it in this, in the good old U.S. of A., you know, is, is about competition. But, you know, sometimes people hear that and they go, oh, I don't want to compete. But, you know, it's not so, it's not a terrible thing. It's really a lot of fun. It's a yeah, wonderful absolutely. thing. And um, so I think, you know, if you see yourself as achievement oriented, you are competing whether you realize yeah. it or not. That is true. That is true. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of our questions. It always goes by so fast. But I wanted to thank you again for coming to talk to us about new rules of the game. It was a fantastic chat. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Amanda. And thanks to all who yeah. called in. And Take listened. care. Have a great one. Bye. Bye. -bye. OK. Bye-bye.